Idly ho, drinkerinos. It is I, Steve Kuntz, back for another episode of the Idaho Booze Podcast. And I am really excited to get to it this week. We have a really fun show this week on the show. Ooh, we've got Sheila Francis, head of the Idaho Brewers United. That's the IBU. They are the union or the guild for idaho's brewers also she's going to talk about some upcoming projects including the trail program they have an app that's going to be coming out and some other fun stuff and what exactly does a brewer's union do she's going to go over all that stuff and more also we have friday night pints coming up on the show some interesting new beers from our friends at sockeye and it looks like we have another one from an outside idaho brewery but we'll Check that out when we get to Friday Night Pints. And we have a lot of fun and interesting stuff in the news as well. So what's going on this week? Well, I was just up in the mountains and it was a lovely time. I hear that it was about 120 down here and it was a nice 100 degrees up there in McCall and Donnelly. Not exactly what you're looking for when you hit the beach, but there were a lot of people up there having a great time. And what I noticed was... Burt's Brewing from right here in Garden City, Idaho, was prominently featured at at least one bar that I went to while I was up there. So kudos to Burt's. They are making some really nice beers over there. If you hadn't had a chance to go over to Burt's and check out their West Coast IPA, their lagers, they have a bunch of traditionally brewed lagers up there, including, I believe, a Hellas Lager, a Pilsner, a specialty lager of some sort. They have their West Coast IPA. They have a double IPA going right now. Just a lot of fun stuff going over there at Burt's. And, you know, take it from me. I I really do like their beers. I think what they're doing has been a lot of fun. I love their tap house. It's a really cool tap house. Lots of room. There's a food truck. There was some music there last time I was there. So if you haven't checked it out yet, that's in Garden City. Saw a lot of Bodhi's Zaffa. Uh, I know it's not an Idaho beer, but it is kind of becoming Idaho's IPA. And if any of the local breweries, and I know Sockeye, they have Dagger, Payette, has Rustler. We have a lot of really good IPAs being made here in Idaho. But it seems to me that Bodhisattva is taking off all over the state. So saw a lot of that. Actually saw a whole shelf uh, of Bodhisattva at the Albertsons up there. And then it was on sale, I think, at the Ridley's. So lots of Bodhisattva being sold up north. We have a great show today. We're going to do some news coming up next and then Sheila later on and Friday Night Pints right after this. This episode is sponsored by Like Button. Okay, you've started a business and you built a website and a Facebook page. Now, where are the new customers? Navigating the waters of digital marketing is time consuming, complicated, and costly. So let Like Button do it for you. With plans starting as low as $2,000, Like Button specializes in helping small businesses grow up and larger businesses scale by putting together a strategy and maximizing ROI numbers through paid ads, omni channel marketing, and even SEO. Go to likebutton.us for your digital marketing needs and get back to doing what you do best grow your business with Like Button. Welcome back to Idaho Booze Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Koontz. We've got a number of news stories going on in and around the Gem State this week, including our first story comes to us from Facebook. Looks like it was a little share from our friends at Western Collective. They're going to expand into fine dining. They're taking their spot down there on Idaho Street and turning it into a try restaurant of sorts. Due West will, uh, well, I'll just read it straight from their post here. Enjoy our warm, sophisticated ambience and start with meticulously prepared tableside cocktails like the Bone Marrow Old Fashioned or Smoked Sage Margarita. Our menu features bold flavors and exquisite ingredients, smoked steelhead riettes, salmon tartare carpaccio, duck tostadas, elk meatballs, king crab mac and cheese, and our $50 burger with foie gras and bone marrow. Experience modern elegance and western charm at Due West. Reservations are suggested. Okay, so that's Due West. That's going to be their new concept. I guess I don't know where it's going to be. The other one, it's called The National. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's just experience a timeless, intimate bar at the restaurant and restaurant at The National 
It's a contemporary homage to classic American restaurant hangouts. So this is upscale takes on beloved dishes. Parker House Rolls, Jumbo Shrimp Cocktail, a tuna tower, pork tomahawk. I'm not really sure what that is. Miso butterscotch sauce or a king salmon. So kind of more fancy there. And then they have the House of, House of Western, which is, I guess, the bowling alley. And this is our original gem. The House of Western continues to offer a casual and fun experience with games, bowling, sports, yada, yada, yada. So basically the question that comes up a lot when I talk to friends about downtown Boise and sort of the um, the restaurant scene is, do we need more of these places that are upscale, fancy, expensive, sort of out of place restaurants? And this is a pair of fancy bars inside one place, you know, tableside cocktails, $50 hamburgers, Parker house rolls, tuna tower, all that stuff sounds great. I love going to Chandler's. I like going to Roos Chris every so often. I like these places because it's a night. It's like a fun, fancy night out. And it's not what I look for when I go to a brewery. This, I thought that when they opened this place up downtown, it was going to be a brewery and it was going to be a little bit more casual. The other thing about this is, what if I'm sitting there with my table side <laughs> uh, bone marrow old fashioned and I'm having my Parker House rolls and my $50 foie gras hamburger and all of a sudden, yep, there it is. That's a strike. And the two people bowling are now throwing whatever their version of Miller Lite is eye at each other and they're screaming and shouting all through my um, upscale, timeless, intimate bar and restaurant experience. So I don't know about this one. It seems to me that they might have bitten off more than they could chew with that building when they purchased it. It was, I think it was a spaghetti house or spaghetti factory or something. So now they're going to try to cram three restaurants into one place. I just don't see how you can be <laughs> enjoying a warm, sophisticated ambiance and then hear someone scream loudly because they missed the seven pin on a spare. It just doesn't seem like it's going to work. But, you know, best luck to you guys, Western Collective. Also, looks like, and this is sort of a more serious thing, on-premise NA beer sales continue to grow. It looks like NA beer sales are up 33% on-premise. So, and then beer is over down overall 2.9%. So, let me explain something for people that may not know what these words are. In the beer industry, we use a lot of different words. We use um, case equivalency. We use on-premise, off-premise. Basically, what all this stuff is, is how beer is sold. So on-premise means that you're drinking the beer or the wine or the spirit or whatever on-premise at the place you're at. So if you're at a restaurant like Dave & Buster's or if you're at you know, uh, due west for your uh, sophisticated ambiance and smoke sage margaritas. That's on premise. You're drinking that on premise. Off premise is when you take it home. So if you go to C store or you go to, which is another thing, C store, convenience store or grocery store, or whatever, you buy your six pack, you take it home, you're drinking it off premise. So on premise in a beer sales growing is troubling for a number of reasons for our friends in the brewing industry. And with breweries like Athletic, and Fremont and Alesmith all putting out pretty good versions of NA beer, it's not hard to sort of come to this conclusion that there's going to be more sales of NA beer. So, But that all used to just happen off-premise. You never really had a growth of NA beer on-premise until right now. And it's troubling because it means that people are going out and stay, staying sober while they're going out which is usually when people want to get cranked up a little bit. And now they're, what, what this is saying, what this is basically saying is people are going to go out, they're going to keep eating at the restaurants, but now they want an NA beer selection. And that means less shelf space or less tap space, if it comes to that, for real beer brewers. And it means a loss of market. So uh, it's just... My thing with NA beer is I enjoy... Some of them. I know um, in my column recently, I inter I did uh, the Fremont Belgian Wit. That was really great. Tasty beer. I think Alesmith had an IPA out, and it was okay. It wasn't great. Athletic has a couple IPAs. 
They have a Pilsner. I think they have like a light lager and they're all just fine. They're not. My thing with beer is if I'm going to drink beer. I'm going to drink beer. And if I'm not going to drink beer, I'm not going to drink beer. Like I don't need to have a hazy IPA that's non-alcoholic and getting those calories and that sort of weird flavor that comes with an NA IPA when I could just, you know, have one that's a IPA IPA. You know, I understand that's not very sensitive to a lot of people that might have a problem or whatever, but that's just the way I am. If I don't want a beer, I'll have iced tea or I'll have water, I'll have maybe even a soda or whatever. So that's just the way I am. And I'm, I'm not saying that everyone has to be like that, but what I am saying is that this NA beer sales being up 33% on premise is a scary number for breweries because it means that people are going out with their loved ones, you know, on a night out and they're not drinking real beer or real wine or real spirits. They're choosing to drink this sort of alternative. So, you know, the big winners in all of these, as always, are the distributors, our friends at the distribution companies, because the distributors, hopefully, if they were smart, caught wind of the NA revolution as it was happening about two or three years ago and started building up their portfolio of NA beer and encouraging their brewer partners to start, you know, brewing more NA beer as well. NA beer sales up 33% on premise nationwide. And they're going to continue to grow, I feel like. If this is sort of the tip of the iceberg as far as NA beer sales on premise, beer overall down 2.9%, scary number two. And I don't know what the answer here is. I guess what it is is maybe, you know, they're going to have to get creative. Maybe come up with different kinds of beers that you can brew that are low alcohol. Maybe there's a 2.5% or 3% table beer out there that's being made in Belgium or England or wherever That might be a good fit for an American drinker as this sort of younger generation of drinkers kind of grows up and decides they don't want to drink as much anymore. So, you know, you could look at that or you could look at, you know, if you're a brewery and you don't brew an NA beer, maybe it's time to start looking at how you can do that and how that's going to work for your brand moving forward. Maybe it's something to add. I don't know what the answer is. I just know that brewers are going to have to, breweries are going to have to look for a way to combat this really scary number, 33% up in a beer sales. So distributors, good for you. Congratulations. Brewers, back to work. Something from our friends at the Full Pint. I love these guys. They are awesome. If you haven't seen them, first subscribe to my blog, then go over to thefullpint.com and subscribe to theirs because they do some great stuff. Anyway, Great Lakes Brewing, our old friends from Cleveland, I want to say the Cleve. They announced they are putting out a Midwest IPA. And I'll just read from their announcement here. 7% alcohol by volume and brewed with a blend of Triumph, Strata, Cascade, and Citra Hops. Midwest IPA is a balanced brew that combines bright aromatic aromas with a smooth body and finish. Described by GLBC, Great Lakes Spring Company, as the unofficial IPA of Midwest Nice. Ooh. Midwest IPA is positioned to become the everyday IPA within the brewery's year-round portfolio. So <laughs> a couple of things. That's really cute. I think it's nice that it's Midwest Nice. It's <laughs> the unofficial IPA of Midwest Nice. And, you know, just coming back from a wedding with a bunch of people who are genuinely Midwest Nice, I have to say that sounds pretty nice. I, I don't know if there are a nicer group of people than the people in the Midwest, but uh, this sounds great. Midwest nice. It sort of sounds like a West Coast style IPA from like you know, just reading bright aromatic aromas. Sounds like it's a little citrusy. Cascade citra hops. Those are kind of citrusy. Citrusy strata. Uh, that can be melony. Yeah, has a couple different. It can be lime zesty. Triumph though. That's where I'm getting a little lost. It sounds kind of aggressive. Triumph hops it doesn't really convey that niceness that it sounds like they're looking for. I mean, cashmere. That's a pretty nice sounding hop um citra uh what's another nice sounding hop hbc 125 maybe not that one so much anyway it does sound aggressive almost like a wu-tang song triumph i think that is a wu-tang song Uh, ipa i think should grow and change but this this doesn't really sound like a thing you can't just slap your geographical location on the beer and pretend that's the new normal Give me a difference. Show me why this nice Midwestern beer is is Midwestern. Uh, you know, like these other brews. We have some other beers here that are, you know, the, the PNW IPA. You guys have seen this, right? It's the Pacific Northwest IPA. I guess it's piney. 
I would imagine being from the Pacific Northwest, I would assume that it's piney. And I don't know that it would be Midwest nice, though. I think the attitude on this one is more sarcastic, sort of mean, with notes of glibness and just a touch, just a little touch of dry humor on that one on the Pacific Northwest IPA. Also, probably likes to be left alone. I'm just guessing. Uh, we already know West Coast IPA, citrusy and bitter. Usually that's what it is. They're usually not very hazy. They're usually pretty see-through, nice and, you know, airy. I'd find that the attitude on the West Coast IPA, far from being, um, you know, the PNW, which is more sarcastic, the Midwest is more nice. These guys are kind of airy and connected. It feels, this IPA feels most at home outside doing something awesome, like, I don't know, pole vaulting over big rocks or riding its bike on the beach or, you know, extreme bungee drafting. I don't really know what the kids are into these days out there on the West Coast, but I'm sure that the West Coast IPA would rather be out there doing that than just sitting in your fridge. Northeast IPA, we know, hazy, citrusy, lots of stone fruit, other fruity flavors. Pretty, you know, these are the hazy IPAs that we've kind of gotten to know over the last few years. This beer, it doesn't really like you. It's from the Northeast. It's cold up there. It doesn't like you, unless it's known you since childhood. And even then, it kind of hates you. The haze looks nice, but you know that the haze was just a mistake that they turned into a marketing gimmick. You know that deep, deep down, don't you? There's no way a brewery went out to create a hazy IPA at first. They created the hazy IPA and then marketed it so that we would be like, oh, wow, look at that haze. Before that, all beer was clear. It was very weird. And also, as an aside to that, and it's maybe a story that I've told before on the blog, I tried to make my guys at Edge brew AZ IPA, and it came out perfectly clear. And I got mad at them for that, which doesn't make any sense. Anyway, that's beside the point. Northeast IPA, hazy, citrusy, doesn't like you, unless you've known it for a long, long time. And even then, kind of doesn't like you. Southern IPA, now we're talking peaches and stone fruit with a hint of smoke. This beer... I got to say, the Southern IPA, really nice to your face. And then it will talk shit to all the other beers, all the other wines, all the other spirits as soon as you leave the room. It's not all bad. Southern IPA likes a lazy Sunday, enjoys fun stuff, like cool, like guttural stuff, stuff that we all should love. Football, motocross, shooting guns, stuff like that. So not all bad. Just it, it will, but the Southern IPA... It will talk shit just as soon as your back is turned. And then we have the Midwestern IPA coming back on this balanced, bright, and aromatic. This beer, I know that Great Lakes has theirs, and that's how they describe theirs is the unofficial IPA Midwest Nice. But really what this beer is, is it's described by others as sort of the salt of the earth or a real America, like a real America type beer. Well, I'm here to tell you that this farce of the flyover territory can easily be tricked into card games, gambling, all sorts of fun stuff that you'll easily win at if you're not a fellow Midwestern IPA. And this Midwestern IPA, I don't know why it sleeps, but it can't do it until it's had that shot of Malort and some kind of meat sandwich. Still, though, even with all these things, no IPA is genuinely as nice as the Midwestern IPA. I can tell you that from experience. Coming up next, we have our interview with Sheila Francis, from the Idaho Brewers United. She's going to talk about what IBU does for brewers, for consumers, for its members, and her history with Idaho beer, which I think you'll find very fascinating. And that is coming up next on the Idaho Booze Podcast. This episode brought to you by Idaho Brewers United, or IBU. Have you heard? IBU is going digital. The Idaho Brewers Trail app will have brewery profiles, beer news, and detailed information on your favorite Idaho beers. As if that's not enough, there will also be a Brewers Trail point system to grant you prizes and rewards just for hitting up Idaho's amazing breweries. Sign up for IBU's Brew News at idahobrewers.org for the app's release and other news from Idaho's brews. All that and more at idahobrewers.org. All right. Joining me today is my good friend, Sheila Francis from Idaho Brewers United. Sheila? Hello. How are you doing? 
oh, just another day, another another day of fun. Another day of fun. I love to hear that. You should have fun working for the IBU, uh, Idaho Brewers United. Tell us a little bit about what that's like day to day. <laughs> day to day. So Idaho Brewers United is the trade association for craft breweries. And we kind of do a lot. Uh, primary goals are to promote and protect the Idaho craft beer industry. So I do things, or we, I should say, even though I'm a mighty organization of one part-time employee, <laughs> uh, promote breweries through various channels, get people to drink Idaho beer, as well as advocate for sound policy to benefit breweries and help breweries grow um, in this interesting uh, beer environment that we're in. <laughs> Well, that sounds like a lot. You have a lot. Oh to yeah, do and there. then you know the admin and the 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 bookkeeping, all the good stuff on top. But that's no one wants. Well, it to sounds like you have a whole stuff. team. It sounds like you have a whole team back there. Though. You know, I have a lot of staff meetings with myself. <laughs> <laughs> I do talk to myself, and I just tell people it's a staff meeting. You know, nice. It makes sense. <laughs> sure, and if someone happens to be walking by or whatever, then you just explain it to them. You just no, I'm having a staff meeting. I legitimately was working in a brewery recently and they're like, are you talking to me? I was like, no, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> so let's go back a little bit. Are you from Boise originally or where are you from originally? Uh, I mean, not originally. It was not my birth certificate. Does not say Idaho, but we moved here as family when I was really young, you know, parents. The Francis clan. The Francis clan. Yes. Parents got a job. So Moved out here when I was itty bitty and kind of been here ever since. I've taken a couple opportunities to uh, leave, explore a little bit, but kept coming back. So I've been from Chicago back since that right? 2011. From Chicago, right? Uh, yeah, in between. So, you know, I did the whole college thing, but I decided to try three different colleges uh, one in Washington, Colorado. Then after graduation, I moved to Austin, working in the music industry. So, oh, nice! I didn't know that about you. What did you do uh, down in Austin? Uh, I worked for a production company that filmed uh, music performance. Cool, that's awesome. How was Austin? How did you like it? Austin was fun. Uh, what I didn't love about it is they don't have four seasons. It's summer and then more summer, right? Yeah, very <laughs> strange. Uh, then. Uh, Went to Chicago for to be an event planner and then came back to good old Boise to work at a brewery. Which brewery did you work at? Well, I worked at this little brewery called Payette Brewing. Uh and so however I started there. did however did a young event planning Sheila Francis get a job at Payette Brewing Company? It's probably I mean it's no secret, but uh my brother Mike started Payette Brewing and he asked me if I was ready to move back and work for him. Uh and he your offered brother, me a job. Your brother, Michael Francis. Yes, not my spouse, brewery. as some people like to tease. <laughs> Started that in 2010? 2011 is when Payette opened. So uh, the brewery opened in May, and I moved back in August to start work. So Because Michael needed help. Well, yeah, I mean, it was him and Jake Black and then uh, Owner of Lost Grove. a bit, yes. And, who was and then at that him? time, you know, I came on to mostly help with marketing and events. And mm -hmm. then, yeah, another one of those, <laughs> the brewery, you know, you, you work with four people and then look what it, it's changed quite a lot since then. So it was you, Michael, Jake, and who else? Um, JT was there and uh, Beef, Keith. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Ian Fuller came on as a brewer as well. That's right. So. Ian was the first brewer that he hired, right? Yes. Because Michael was brewing. Before then, Michael was brewing himself. He was, yeah. And really fortunate to meet Ian. Uh, really, he's a great brewer, great person. So I think, Amazing. you know, it's hard to run a business and be the brewer. What is sort of, so you'd say your history with Idaho beer sort of, you started working at Payette, you were doing the marketing basically there. And how did that sort of move you from being at Payette to what you're doing now? Uh, so it kind of started with events and trying to figure out 
what we needed to do to, you know, beer is highly regulated alcohol. You got to go through all these hoops. So really it started out of just trying to figure out what we needed to do to be legal and protect the business. And in doing so, learned a lot about, you know, local city code as well as uh, state code and kind of found myself asking questions about why is this like this? Who decided it should be like this? Just a couple weird things that, you know, you'd never know were in existence unless you were really deep into the code. So um, at that point, I thought it was a little silly. We didn't have an organization. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple others that had expressed interest in starting a centralized organization. And I kind of made it my personal mission to not be the last state in the country to have a brewer's guild. Not bad. We didn't, we were not last. We were like, yeah, low 40s, I'm going to say. So okay. check so that you, off the list. So but we, we sort of have like a weird uh, parallel. Because while you were doing that here for Payette, I was doing almost the exact same thing at Epic Brewing Company in Utah. So yes. I had a lot. I think I might have had more weird rules than you did. But oh, what's 100%. the weirdest rule that you can think of off the top of your head right now that you looked at, like kind of got this going? Well, it wasn't necessarily weird, but it was not well understood that Strong beer was considered wine, therefore taxed as wine. And what yep. was not well understood at that time was as a result, strong beer taxes were going to promote wine, a, a portion of them, I should say. And a large portion, would you say? Uh well, the dollar figure that we ended up figuring out, I mean, it was uh yeah, it wasn't insignificant. So it, it was, was just more than those... say it was more than say zero percent. Like much higher than zero percent. So, and it's hard. <laughs> so what's interesting is nobody actually knew how much money it was because mm -hmm. uh, in, in my discussions with the tax commission over the years to figure this out, you know, they likened it to sales tax. We don't care if that money came from mangoes or it came from pencils. It's 6% and we collect it. Right. So when they were collecting strong beer and wine taxes, they, there was no way at that time for them, unless somebody manually went in and did it. And this was all by paper, mind you, because no. uh, everyone filed paper tax re returns on a monthly basis. Unless someone went in and wanted to compile that information, there was no way to know what was coming from beer and what was coming from wine. So it was a, it was a process to decipher that. That's interesting. So all of our hardworking brewers here were making beers that happened to be above what was it five percent something like that five point something percent well it's it's another was like annoying things and i'm sure you get this coming from utah like three two is not three two percent by volume it's by oh, weight no no and nobody it's uses much more it difficult. by weight but it's by weight which makes no different no, no sense at all yeah so it's really like utah beer is four percent by volume which is what everyone is used to so yeah it was and that was a part of the code switch too it was Four percent by weight, not ball. It was it was very mm -hmm. silly, but um, we did so end up resolving Idaho, that issue. And so in Idaho, was it the same? Was it also four percent? Four percent by weight. Oh, by weight. So it was like five, like five something. Yeah. Okay. But we changed it because I was like, no one talks in weight. Let's you know that's like us trying to talk in centimeters. So we just don't do that. Yeah, exactly. It's the. I mean, it's not even really. It's like us talking in Kelvin instead of Fahrenheit. It's just a completely, by weight, is a completely different measurement. I couldn't even tell you what it is. I just know that 3.2 is sort of 4%, and that 4% by weight is sort of 5.1% or something like that. Like, Five I couldn't tell like you how I know. something. Right? Yeah. I'm not going to pretend I'm a brewer. Never have been. I have tried home brewing. It is not my thing. I will <laughs> enjoy the finished product. Thank you. Yeah. No, I get that. I have home brewed and I have wanted to be a brewer and I still don't understand the byway thing. Anywho, so you get involved with some of this stuff and you start kind of moving some of the breweries towards a sort of general consensus that there needs to be some sort of commission or you know union or something of that nature because 
wine was our wine had a really good one right i think hops have one grain has one right all these people have one of these sort of unions is that correct well in a way and what's different about a lot of things for the types of uh products that you mentioned they're all uh they were all formed as commissions or in like the 50s, 60s, 70s type of thing. And so they actually receive state funding, usually in a way of like a checkoff, like, you know, um, an assessment or a portion of taxes. Well, that's only in the wine commission, like a portion of taxes collected. So it's just a different beast, but they also have to play by different rules in a way where they have, you know, they're a quasi government agency. So they have some limitations. Uh, when we were looking and exploring the issue, you know, we'd at that time, becoming a, a quasi-government entity wasn't anything we remotely even one knew how to do or were going to be able to figure out at that time. Uh, we were all little babies in the beer industry. So <laughs> we went the, the guild route is what the Brewers Association calls it. And essentially, it's just the trade association. Basically, what you saw was all these weird rules, a bunch of money being spent on things that weren't beer and needing to find a kind of path forward for the beer industry here in Idaho to grow up, right? Yeah. And, you know, being my, I was young, ambitious, and full of energy. I was ready to, you know, that was just kind of you're my still, passion project. You're still at, at least two of those things. Still at least two of those things. <laughs> Don't specify. At the very least, two of those things. <laughs> so, uh, so you saw this kind of thing that you needed. And so how did it kind of start? How did you... Who obviously you probably roped in. I would say Payette was probably on board pretty quickly. Who else did you get on board? I don't think my that? brother had much of a choice. He certainly did not. Um. Yeah. So really, the founding group. Uh. You know, I can't say I did this alone necessarily. So, uh, Kevin Bolin, who at the time was, was he still with Grand Teton? Might have been. Yeah. yeah. Uh, him, Penny Pink from Portneuf, Matt Gans from. Salmon River and myself and a couple other I'm I feel like I'm missing someone and sorry. Uh just saw that saw that it was a missing piece. Uh to you know, at the time breweries at that time we had a hard time figuring out even how many breweries there were in the state, just since everyone is so spread out. And just go Facebook talk to Bob Hubler. Just talk what? to Bob Hubler. You just go talk to Bob Hubler. He'll tell you. Yeah, I don't exactly. think I knew Bob at the time. You didn't know Bob? I so, yeah, the group, I mean, we really got it. But in then 2012, we had our quote unquote first meeting uh, over in Idaho Falls since everyone was going to be there. And that's really when it kicked off and started. And we had a board of directors election and uh, adopted bylaws and made it official. One of the bigger things and uh, dear old Fred Colby, formerly of Laughing Dog, Yep. You know, his big thing was some of these laws about ownership stakes and the various legal hurdles, as well as the wine money. So from the outset, figuring out the strong beer tax and how to either make that benefit breweries or, you know, what could come of it. Uh, but essentially, so beer dollars were being used to promote uh, competitive products. Uh, that was really number one for a lot of people. Yeah. And for good reason. I mean, you don't want to, nobody, literally no other business organization or group or whatever you want to call it product does that. They don't pay money into a fund to help their competitors beat them. <laughs> well, there's not a lot of people that have an excise tax either. There's only like a <laughs> dozen or so products. So <laughs> insult <Yeah>. to injury. <laughs> yeah. So not only were... <laughs> That's a great point. Not only were they being charged this excise tax, that was, it's totally against what we really should be doing, but that extra money was going to help sell less beer and sell more wine. So that's good that you guys got together and, and sort of defeated that, I would say. I mean, that was a 10 year process though. So, you know, overnight success takes, years. takes a decade. It took 10 years to get that fixed? Yes. And what what did that sort of entail? the short short version <laughs> oh the short version um a lot of discussion and research fighting infighting sort of resolution 
and two attempts at the legislature to pass a bill to make some clarifications and a lot of a lot of negotiation down at the state house as well. And then it now now 5% of the strong beer taxes that are collected beers it's considered beer now and it actually goes to the Idaho Hop Growers Commission. Oh okay. That's interesting. So you have a so you're working with the Hop Grower Commission. Yeah, so we we've worked with them a lot in a lot of, you know, I essentially we appeal to them to support a lot of our marketing projects since it's mutually beneficial of, you know, more more beer equals more hops since hops are exclusive nearly exclusively used in beer. So, uh right. it's been a good partnership for us and I hope for them uh to do some of these projects like the Idaho Brewers Trail Map and now forthcoming that sounds great. Let's talk about those coming up next. We're going to take a quick break, quick break, and we'll talk about those right after this. This episode is sponsored by Like Button. Okay, you've started a business and you built a website and a Facebook page. Now, where are the new customers? Navigating the waters of digital marketing is time consuming, complicated, and costly. So let Like Button do it for you. With plans starting as low as $2,000, Like Button specializes in helping small businesses grow up and larger businesses scale by putting together a strategy and maximizing ROI numbers through paid ads, omni channel marketing, and even SEO. Go to likebutton.us for your digital marketing needs and get back to doing what you do best grow your business with Like Button. We are back with Sheila Francis. Sheila, hey. Hello again. So we were talking about how you sort of came up your, I wouldn't say sorted, but your past, how it all <laughs> led to where you are right now. And you mentioned a couple of programs you have coming out, a couple of projects, including a really exciting app, right, that you guys are putting together. Yes, I, my goodness, the Idaho Brewers Trail app, I'm not sure that's what the official name is going to be, is a very, very, very exciting project that has been a very long time coming. We've had the physical printed Brewers Trail map uh, out in the world for a while, and we've done a few additions with the support of Visit Idaho, Idaho Preferred, and Idaho Hop Growers Commission. But of course, it's paper. And once it's out there, it's usually there's a mistake or something's out of date. So it's a, the minute it's a beautiful labor it. of love, but the industry moves fast. <laughs> it's the minute you print something, it is out of date. Is that Has that been your um, you know, I think I've gotten fortunate where I've gotten at least a week of being a hundred percent accurate. That's not bad. I think I I'm feel being like really every time I've printed myself, anything, though. I feel like every time I've printed anything, it's been like maybe 36 hours of it being 100 percent accurate. Yeah. Even when I when I wrote and got my book done, uh something had happened. I can't remember offhand what exactly it was. Oh, a bunch of breweries uh a bunch of breweries started basically the year after my book came out. Uh, uh huh. Yeah. So I got about 365 days out of that. It is currently in development and theoretically I'll be testing it in the next couple of weeks. And it's going to be really cool because we can actually include a lot more information uh, that we can perpetually update, which is amazing. So ad breweries or breweries will be able to add, you know, their tap room hours, their tap lists, if they would like to do so. So really just, it it's growing on what we've started and making it even more valuable for the consumer and anyone wishing to visit Idaho breweries. So as you said before, you're sort of a, a committee of one over there at IBU. So who is going to be updating the app because you couldn't possibly go to every single brewery in the state every single <laughs> other day. Well, what is neat is the development company I'm working with, uh, their company that has done a ton of these types of apps, um, and namely for a few other, or more than a few other state guilds as well, they'll actually start and populate 
for everyone I tell them to populate it with. So I give them as much information as possible. But then it'll kind of be up to the breweries to log in and make sure it's updated. Then, of course, I, being kind of type A, will try and oversee that or um, remind people that, you know, of course, check, call, etc. before you go to a brewery. So you're not disappointed if something changed and we weren't able to update it. <laughs> but no, I'm not coding kinda, this thing. Kind of type A. What? I like things <laughs> to be correct. <laughs> I'm like the Dyson guy. <laughs> I just want things to work properly. And this this cyclone of yours that you've created will be powered by the brew, by the individual breweries. They're going to be updating it as much as they can. And you will be there to offer gentle reminders to keep it updated, correct? Yes, I am. A, I love the gentle reminders. But yeah, I mean, it's going to start out really, really well populated, thankfully. And we're going to have a really good kickoff uh, where, you know, my role of helping launch this thing is to go through with a fine tooth comb. So try to be as accurate as possible. But and you'll no, be sending there's out no information about tap links. room hours or beer lists on the printed map. So I think this, regardless if it's 90% correct, I think it's good. And you'll be sending out beta invites to certain members of the community as well, right? Oh, are you fishing for one? <laughs> well, <laughs> it would be nice to know what's on tap, you know, without having to uh, call every single brewery as I've done lately, asking for what's new and what's coming out. I got to go see if the passport works because that is also see if the passport what works. we're doing. We're gamifying it. You're going to do a trail program. Yeah. So you'll be able to check in at breweries and we're working on the exact uh, mechanics of it. But essentially, you know, your visits are going to be, you'll get a stamp, a digital stamp. Uh, so you don't need to do anything just well besides open the app and check in. But mm -hmm. we are going to create prize levels where you can redeem your prize or redeem your, you know, you visit 10 breweries, hit redeem. I'm going to mail you a pack of stickers or something like that. We haven't quite nailed it down on the prizes, but it's just a way to gamify it. Because right now it's purely informational on paper. Uh, so I think I think fun. we could probably workshop some of those prizes right now. Like I think if I visit 25 breweries in the next, let's say, six months. That's a like a Vespa scooter. <laughs> I think you mistake us for an organization with a much larger budget. <laughs> well, now that you're now that you're getting all this fat wine money, you guys should have the bag, as the kids like to say. Is that not the case, or am I mistaken? I've never heard kids say that. Oh, the kids say that a lot. That's exactly. Well, you, your you, kids yeah, are you much have... too young to say anything like that. So <laughs> you have to have. Kids that are well into their late teens and early 20s. Foreign language. But yeah, so I am currently, actually, that's what I was working on earlier, was what would be good prizes that, you know, it's kind of hard to put a stamp on a Vespa and make sure it gets to you where it needs to go. But... So, you know, um, you know those, can do you know what a cameo is? Yes. So, yes, I do. Problem solved. What you do is you get Josh over at Sockeye to record cameos for everybody. And he could just be like, hey, this is, and he's, he, he'd be down. He'd really be down for that. I was he trying to figure that. out where you were going with that because in my head, I was like, people don't want to hear from me. <laughs> Ooh, I want to hear your version of what I was thinking. I think it's much funnier than my version. Well, I mean, some of those cameos, you're like, you know, just saying hey from your favorite random. Yeah, that's exactly right. Hey, it's Tyler Evans. Hi, I'm Tyler Evans. And I'm... I'm wishing you a happy birthday. And right now, it looks like I'm working on refinishing a table. Wishing well, you a happy if, birthday. If Tyler Packaging wants to participate, maybe we could get some, like, beer hot sauce or something. Yeah, hey, it's me, Bear Island Beth. Underwater, diffusing this thing. Happy anniversary. <laughs> thanks for visiting thanks for visiting 20 breweries this month let's put a pin in that idea and uh come back to it this is awesome i love the app idea i love that uh, you're going to incorporate the trail program into that and i kind of want to get into more of what ibu offers to brewers so 
first of all, first off, I guess we should probably recognize at least some of you don't have to name all of them, but who, which breweries are kind of prominent members of the IBU right now? Well, I guess prominent is a is a relative term. So we have a great board of directors, and those are it's a volunteer position that um, brewery owners or employees can um, serve on the board, and they really are kind of the steering committee of what's going on. So uh, currently on the board, we have uh, Mother Earth Brewing, we've got Wallace Brewing, Loose Screw. You know, we've got representation from all over, and that's a kind of a big deal. And we've had, you know, former board members that are still pretty active, you know, White Dog, Payette. So there's a lot of Is that of what you kind of look for when you're trying to put together the board is you want it to be kind of all over? The, you want it to make sure that you're representing Northern Idaho, Eastern Idaho, that sort of thing? Yeah, it's not necessarily with – it's in our bylaws to represent, uh, you know, packaging breweries versus – or I guess like primarily distributing – distributing breweries versus brew pubs and kind of the new mm -hmm. hybrid model of a tap house, uh, a tap room brewery. But we really try to recruit from various parts of the state just, just because there are things going on everywhere. Um, and it's not fair. And I try to be really, really aware of the great state of Ada and that there's a lot more breweries to serve than those right here in the area. Boise area where I live. <laughs> True. So you have a bunch of, how many members all in all do you have right now? Uh, we're about 60% uh, of the active breweries are all members right now. So it is membership so optional. How many breweries are there right now? 110? No, we, well, we were getting close to 100, but uh, been a rough couple months and we're uh, kind of in the low 90s right now. Okay, I think, yeah, that's right. 95 or something like that, right? So we've lost a couple of breweries. That'll happen. That's just, you know, the way it works in the that's market. Growth, yeah. It sucks. It sucks, but that's what happens. So what does IBU offer to these member breweries? Or maybe, like, pretend like I'm a brewery that isn't yet a member. Like, what are you offering me if I join, join up with IBU? Because aren't you just going to go ahead and do all this stuff anyway? Like, why do you need me? As an organization... We understand what the brewing community is. We have a greater understanding of what breweries potentially need and can better communicate to policy makers about what, what you're facing. So um, even if you think legislatively you don't have anything happening and it's not going to affect you or impact you, there's still, I mean, things that happen in Boise at the cap during the legislative session can and will impact you kind of universally that's not necessarily based on your location or your size you're not insulated from everything and additionally trying to give brewers an opportunity for different types of promotions and offer connections you know I'll often you know visit Idaho will call me and say hey we've got a journalist coming into this town or what breweries can we set them up for a tour with so really trying to provide and refer those promotional opportunities. And it's been on a bit of a hiatus, but we're trying to bring it back is educational opportunities. So, you know, we're not the National Brewers Association and can't do a craft brewers conference, but we try to host some sort of educational summit and bring in speakers or suppliers uh, to, to teach the industry and, you know, give you updates on what's going on. So it's not just another pay your dues type of thing. I really want to be there to support breweries. Um, right now, I'm working closely with a lot of Boise breweries as they're facing some difficult wastewater questions. And so that's kind of the role of the guild is I hope you don't need me. But when you do, I'm ready. What do you offer to consumers? Because I imagine that consumers are a big part of what you do. I know you have a couple of awesome or I know you have at least one. Oh, you had two events this year. Is that right? You had the one at the depot and then you have Destination Beer. Talk about what what are the, what those are and how that sort of works for consumers. Yeah. So consumers, I mean, beer, without consumers, there is no beer industry. People just can't make beer for funsies and then let it hang well, out. Well, brewers can drink a lot of beer, but they can't drink that much beer. That's like, that like hurt my brain trying to think of how long it would take me to drink an entire keg 
I don't want to think about that. <laughs> but like, we try to do signature <laughs> events. And one, one thing I really strive for is something that's a little bit, a little bit unique. I mean, there's, there's a lot of beer festivals and th it's great. And I think a lot of them do a really good job of supporting their communities, but coming from the beer industry itself, uh, I try to make things just a, a little bit unique uh, and be approachable. So Destination Beer is an event in McCall. It's going to be January 31st and February 1st. And it's kind of a, it's semi outdoors. We have a heated tent, but we really yeah. try to elevate the experience where your admission includes catered appetizers. And I really encourage breweries to bring at least one new or special brew um, I'm not going to say everyone brings something exclusive just because it's challenging to do that, but kind of bring that elevated experience of beer and food. Uh, and then Beer and Friends was our first ever collaboration event at the depot. Mm -hmm. And it was really exciting. It was a great venue. I don't know how many conversations I had about, wow, I haven't been to the depot like either ever or it's been a really, really long time. I think my kids came here on a field trip. 10 years ago or whatever, but every single beer on tap was the result of two or more entities making something new and exciting. And they were all released on that day. So everything was new and we're looking to return. We're trying to do something in North Idaho this fall or winter. Um, we've had something up there before and just trying to grow on that because there's a lot of opportunity up North for consumers, especially Finding an Idaho only event is more challenging. A lot of, you know, nothing wrong with out of state brewers, but I think it's really great to to focus on what's available here and the breweries that support the local communities. And so we try to feature only Idaho breweries. And we'll invite yeah, a one especially as the, just because we like yeah. variety too. Yeah, especially because the Idaho the Idaho brewing community has expanded so much in the last 10 years. It's nice that we could find I me mean, before when we had like a beer fest, you would have to bring in other people, you know, mm -hmm. because there were only like, you know, 15 or 20 breweries and 10 would sign on for the beer fest and 10 breweries does not a beer fest make. So yeah, absolutely. So destination beer has always been one of my favorite events. It is super cold. But you're right that uh, that hint that heated tent is nice. It's nice up there, and it was not the appetizer that cold this really year. Cool. It wasn't. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> we've it's experienced gonna be the coldest weekend of the winter, and we've experienced the warmest weekend of the winter. So we really get it all. <laughs> <laughs> and the boy, the beer. It was beer plus friends or beer and friends. Thing. I call it, it's, oh. I mean, it, it's a plus side, but beer and friends. Right. A lot of really cool collaborations came out of that. Is that right? So basically what that was, was brewers got you put brewers together with either people or other brewers and they, they made a collaboration beer, right? Yeah. So pretty minimal guidelines. It was, you know, one, one entity has to be an Idaho Brewers United brewery member. Mm -hmm. And then you just had to collaborate with another, a partner in some fashion of either another brewery and in-state or out-of-state, some sort of producer, like a, a farmer or grower or supplier of malts or hops, et cetera. And there's some that they got a little more creative and uh, collaborated, you know, coffee roaster. So it just, it was yeah. fun. And then the other stipulation was they just couldn't release it before the event. <laughs> So really quick, what was your favorite collab or what were your, a couple of the collaborations you had that sort of stood out to you at that event? Well, one that was, there was a couple that were really exciting just because we don't typically get them in the market. So um, I actually picked up keg, a keg from Off the Rails Brewing that collaborated with Eruption Brewing. So Pocatello and Lava Hot Springs. And they did a... Lava. Oh my gosh, was it a blood orange hef? It was a beautiful pink so. color. It was very refreshing. And it was just, it was great to hear from so many people like, who are these breweries? I've never heard of them. So, you know, trying to get their names out. Um, I had the awesome 
job of I went to St. Mary's to pick up a beer from Two Saints Brewing and they collaborated with a coffee roaster. Uh, so that's another one. Like you're not going to get that in Boise on a typical basis. You got to wait for someone nope. like me to go be dedicated and go <laughs> get it. <laughs> Need sort of type A Sheila to go out and get it. Or like, well, I guess if I, if I want this to happen, I'm going to go get it. <laughs> Sheila Francis, thank you very much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. We've already taken way too much of your time. And is there anything else you want people out there to know about IBU or what you guys are doing? Oh, man. Well, thanks for having me. It's great. Uh, I guess they can, people can subscribe to our newsletter, and that's where they're going to get the best notifications about when the app is available for downloads and when you know our various tickets and event stuff go on sale. All right. Well, Sheila Francis from Idaho Brewers United, thank you so much for being on the show today. And I hope to see you again sometime soon, hopefully at one of your member breweries. Woohoo. Thank you, Steve. Welcome back to the Idaho Booze Podcast. I am your host, Steve Kuntz. We are at the Friday Night Pints portion of our podcast here. Sakai dropped a quattro of new beers on us this week including the Haze Noxious Imperial IPA. Oh, I'm sorry, the Imperial Hazy IPA. Haze Noxious. This is a hazy version of Hop Noxious, brewed with El Dorado Mosaic and Idaho 7. It says aggressively brewed on the, on the uh, thing they put out on Facebook. Citrus and mint. You get a little bit of that mint from the El Dorado. Lots of citrus from the mosaics. Idaho 7, to me, and this might just be me, because... I all I smell anytime I it might be one of those things where you your sensors get it but it's not there but I see the words Idaho Seven and I think green tea like immediately and this I do get a little bit of that green tea on there it's not overwhelming overpowering anything but you get the citrus and the mint and just a touch of this green tea the citrus is very assertive it's nice it's uh, like orangey grapefruity and lemon zest sort of assertiveness and there's a good amount of that El Dorado mint in there as well, which is again not not a not a knock at all. The mint is nice. It's, it's also subtle that and then with this one, you get a touch of booze. And it's, you know, it's not just a touch. It's like a sockeye touch, which is kind of like a hammer. And again, that's just what it is. It tastes great. Awesome beer. Even with touch of uh, even with that touch of booze, it does come off as very quenchable, very drinkable. Just like Hopnoxious, uh, though it does pack a punch. And this one is a nice, big, hazy IPA. So I think it's cool that a local brewer is doing one of these. Because we see a lot of them from other breweries around the country. But this is nice. It's a big, big, hazy, 9%, 35 IBU. Cashmere, uh, this is a single hot pail from the Sakai Single Hot Pail series. This is the newest one, and it's made with cashmere hops. These are these are kind of fun hops, cashmere. It's a hop that you can use to bitter. It's a hop that you can use to flavor. Uh, I really do like these single hop pails. It's it's really nice. There's a citra one, I think, and there's one other one I'm forgetting. But it is a nice way if you are a home brewer and you want to figure out what a hop is sort of like, you can go and grab one of these guys, and it'll tell you. And if you're just someone who enjoys a, a beer – this will be a great way for you to kind of get into hops maybe a little bit. This one brewed with salmon safe cashmere hops. So that means that these are one these are hops that were grown, I would say probably organically without any sort of chemicals or anything that can harm the salmon in the streams. And these were brewed at Mill 95 up there in Wilder. Our friends at Mill 95, awesome that they were able to uh, get these cashmere hops over to Sakai. So in this one, you get melon, some coconut, which is kind of fun, and a sort of spritey aroma on the nose. I would say like limon. Is that what we would call it? Limon? Very cool. The flavor is nice and clean with bright melon, lemon, and lime zest. And just a touch of that coconut on there. Kind of like a pina colada with a daiquiri, but toned way down with that melon flavor as well. Nice little beer. I would definitely give this one a shot. It should be in cans in and around town. 4.5%, 30 IBU. I would give that one a try. I like those beers. Those single hop pails are nice. And cashmere is a fun hop that is, a lot of people don't know about. I don't know that a lot of breweries around here use it. I feel like this is a hop that's used in uh, a lot of New Zealand and maybe in California too. I don't know. I, I don't see it a lot. So get on there and try that cashmere single hop pail from Sakai out. 
Then these last two, I haven't tried them yet. On Holiday English Summer Ale. Sakai calls it the quintessential English summer ale. It's brewed with orange peel, clover, honey, and coriander. Coriander. Sounds like a Belgian wit, uh, minus some of that sweetness. And it's on nitro, and it's up over 6%, so those flavors of honey, orange, and coriander, I imagine, pop in that beer pretty well. So give that a try if you're at either Sakai location. That's on holiday, English summer ale. And then in the cask, they have Vienna Lager, aged on Spanish cedar. Haven't tried this one yet. I uh, probably, hopefully, maybe we get there, get over to Sakai and try this one out. I love Vienna Lager. Their Vienna Lager, especially, is really tasty. And that Spanish cedar will do a good job of bringing out some of those spice tops and sweet malt. And then it'll give it just a little bit of that splintery kind of wood to round it out. So Michael Teeter, our friend at Whole Foods, has a pick of the week. It's not an Idaho beer, I'm sorry to say. But one that we love around here, and that is Fort George Brewing Three-Way Hazy IPA. This is a second iteration of their three-way IPA. The last one still sitting in my fridge. Nice silver can on that one. This one has a black can brewed with Brujos and Ghost Town Brewing. As you know, and maybe you don't, the Fort George Three-Way IPA is a yearly tradition from our friends in Astoria. They get a couple of other breweries involved, and they brew a big IPA, put it in big cans, and send it out in a big way. And it's always a nice treat this time of year. The last one they did was a West Coast style. This one's a hazy IPA. It's really citrusy with some melon, uh, velvety on the tongue, which helps hide that 8% ABV. And just a nice, sounds like a nice hazy IPA that you can get now at Whole Foods. Just go over there, ask for Michael Teeter. He'll point you in the right direction. And we have a new brewery alert out. Um, looks like Farmers Brewing out of Chico, California is coming to town. Look for that at your favorite bottle shop and on tap around town. I gotta tell you, I don't know a lot about Farmers Brewing. I'm looking to get to know them a little bit more, but if Hayden Beverage wants to bring them in, I'll give them a try. I think that, you know, Farmers Brewing out of Chico, if they're coming all the way out here to share their beers with us, we should at least give them a try. So give them a try. Let me know what you think about those and these other beers that are featured on this week's Friday Night Pints at IdahoBoozePod at gmail.com. You can get a hold of me and, uh, you know, tell me how I'm doing. Tell me what I should be trying. Tell me how I can make the show better because this show is not just for me. This is a show for all of us. It is a, definitely a show about and for breweries, beers, beer nerds, home brewers, whatever you want, in and around the gem state. And I want your feedback as much as I can. So get at me, IdahoBoozePod at gmail.com is the email address. I'd like to thank Sheila Francis for coming on and spending some time with us. She is really I can't stress this enough. She is such a cool person. And what she's doing with IBU and what she has done over the last decade plus really is commendable. And I hope that you were able to learn a little bit more about what IBU offers to brewers and consumers and to their members and what they have coming up. I really hope that that interview helped bring some of that to light because I don't think a lot of people know exactly what she does or who she is or you know, kind of how she makes all these things happen. And ultimately, she makes them happen for us, right? So she goes out there and gets an excise tax lowered, or she goes out there and makes sure that beers are being promoted in the area. It all comes back to brewers and consumers, and we all win because of what Sheila's doing. So thank you so much, Sheila, for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. We had some fun news. You can look up all those stories in the show notes. We'll have all the, you know, all the links there for you to check out. This has been the Idaho Booze Podcast. I am your host, Steve Kuntz, signing off on episode three. Good day and good drinking, everyone. Good day and good drinking.